Hi, this is Sam Stevens. Welcome to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment presented by Better Bee. I'm Jeff Ott. I'm Becky Masterman. And I'm Kim Flottam. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Sherry. And a quick shout out to all of our sponsors whose support allows us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Be sure to check out all of our content on our website. There you can read up on all our guests, Read our blog on the various aspects and observations about beekeeping. Search for, download, and listen to over 200 past episodes. Read episode transcripts, leave comments and feedback on each show, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Thanks to Sam Stevens for that great opening. Hey, folks, you know you two can have your opening on the beginning of our podcast just by sending it to us at questions at Beekeeping Today podcast, and we'd be happy to put it on the air. And it's very easy to do. Just simply record yourself on your mobile device, even on your computer, and we'll play it. It's pretty painless. Isn't that so, Becky? It is painless. And you know what? It's a lot of fun. So it's, it's a bragging point. It is fun to have our listeners open the show for us. That's good. Yeah, I like to hear where they're from. So, Becky, we haven't talked about this. Are you big into movies? Let's see. I've never actually been in a movie. But no, I bet no, that's not no. Your have question. you gone to the movies? <laughs> have you gone to the movies? Oh, my goodness. Oh, so I do. I don't go very often, but I do like the movies. It's often something that my husband and I do together is watch at least watch a movie at home on one of the streaming channels. Do you know the actor Jason Statham? You know, the Expendables, the Transporter series? So I only know him from his Wikipedia page. He's British, correct? Yes, and, yes. And he's quite popular. Quite popular. But I think I know him because what you're about to ask me next. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> I can't wait for this. I really can't wait for this. He is releasing a movie in January. It's called Brrr, The Beekeeper. Can you believe that? I, I just think that our whole industry should like buy a ticket and go on the same night, just as oh. a, a sign of unity. It's an action movie, too. I mean, which <laughs> I don't know that a lot of our beekeepers could get a part like that in a movie, right? <laughs> you know, folks, if you want to have some fun, go to YouTube, just do uh, Jason Statham, beekeeper, and watch the trailer. You'll know a beekeeper like this guy. Well, maybe not, but... well. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know Jason Statham and his movies and you know a beekeeper, it's not a likely match, but it is going to be a fun movie. I'm looking forward to seeing it because he says in his cool British or low accent, I'm the beekeeper. And it's just like, well, that's a cross between Jason Statham and, and the Terminator. But uh, there Arnold you go, would folks. be okay with it, I think. He's, <laughs> I think Arnold would be just fine. It it looks like a super fun movie, and and I think as a beekeeper, it's always fun, even if they get it wrong. It's always fun to see bees featured in in movies or in books. It's it's a lot of fun. Well, actually, I don't know how much bees are in the movie, but they're at the very beginning. So there That's you go. That's all you need. Yeah, there's <laughs> opening scenes of the trailer with him out in the field full of bees and hives. Very peaceful, serene. It's kind of like a predictor of things to come. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Hey, I'm looking forward to our guest today. We're welcoming back Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Sammy Ramsey, he's been on our show. Well, we'll talk to him here in just a few moments, but he's been on this. I think this will be his fifth time on the show. So he's a, he's a regular. 
He's an angel. He deserves guest. to be. Yeah. He deserves to be. Yep. I think an hour with Dr. Ramsey is an hour that every beekeeper should have every year, if not more. He's He's got so much great information and this hour is going to just fly by. I'm looking forward to it. So let's get right to our talk with Samuel Ramsey right after this word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Strong Microbials presents an exciting new product, Superfuel, the probiotic fondant that serves as nectar on demand for our honeybees. Superfuel is powered by three remarkable bacteria known as bacilli, supporting bees in breaking down complex substances for easy digestion and nutrient absorption. This special energy source provides all the essential amino acids, nutrients, polyphenols, and bioflavonoids, just like natural flower nectar. Vital for the bee's nutrition and overall health, Superfuel is the optimal feed for dearth periods over winter survival or whenever supplemental feeding is needed. The big plus is the patties do not get hive beetle larvae, so it offers all bioavailable nutrients without any waste. Visit strongmicrobials.com now to discover more about Superfuel and get your probiotic fondant today. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. It is my great pleasure to welcome back our good friend of the show. He's been with us. This is your fifth time, Sammy. Dr. Samuel Ramsey, University of Colorado. He's an assistant professor. I'll let you go through all the other little dots underneath <laughs> your name. But Sammy, welcome back to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. It is wonderful to be back. I can't believe it's been five times already. I must have lost count. No, well, yeah, and that doesn't even include the holiday replays that we featured your <laughs> yeah. show. So that's technically <laughs> six or seven or something like that. But anyways, who's counting? Glad anyway? to be here. <laughs> you guys have a pretty wide reach when it comes to beekeepers and bee enthusiasts. And so it's always great to get to jump out here and talk to everybody. Well, good. Thank <laughs> I you. love it. It's so Fantastic. nice to see you, Sammy. Jeff, you're going to have trouble because you're going to have to fight for questions because I really want to catch up with Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> The feeling is mutual. <laughs> you've been all over the place. And I mean that in a literal sense. And you've been doing a lot of research. Last time you were on the show, you had just unpacked your bags in Boulder, Colorado, at the University of Colorado. So kind of give us an update. Well, first, for that one beekeeper out there who doesn't know who you are. <laughs> is that possible? <laughs> I think it's possible. They're a new beekeeper then. <laughs> that's, that's right. right. But we don't want to exclude anybody. So if you can just kind of give us a quick synopsis of who you are, your background, how you got into bees, and then bring us up to date from last November when you were last on the show. As Jeff has already said, I am Dr. Sammy. I am a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm your friendly neighborhood entomologist. <laughs> um, I have a nonprofit called the Ramsey Research Foundation, and partnering with the university, it really forms the international arm of my lab, the Boulder Bee Lab, where I'm able to conduct research on a much broader scale than I have available to me otherwise. And so there's only one species of honeybee in the U.S. But if you really want to understand honeybee biology, honeybee diseases, you've got to go to the cradle of civilization for honeybees. And that happens to be Southeast Asia, a region of the world where literally every single species of honeybee is present. So I conduct research there. I'm trying to compile the most expansive list of all of the different diseases and parasites of honeybees so that we are never surprised by a new organism again as it pertains to honeybees and beekeeping. And then in the domestic part of my lab, working with my graduate students, my postdocs, my, my entire lab, we're all involved in trying to better understand how to manage the threats and issues within bee populations here in the U.S., so that's both the native bees, as many native bee species as we can work with, and the honeybees. And that has been really, really exciting. And I, I literally got into the subject of studying honeybees from being obsessed with those tiny little varroa mites that you may or may not have heard of. They are absolutely fascinating creatures, and they just just grabbed my attention and have consistently kept me wrapped. They're incredibly clever organisms. 
Now, I know whenever I say things that sound complimentary of things like varroa mites, people get a little, a little, tense. Get a little anxious, <laughs> get a little, a little upset with me. I've gotten some comments on my, my Instagram. So don't <laughs> at me. Back off. But they are fascinating. They're clever. When we take the time to actually understand these organisms and recognize how clever they are, that's when we really have the capacity to do something about them. You need to know them in order to kill them. Is that what you're saying? (laughs) Yes, know your enemy. (laughs) Now you're starting to scare me, Becky. You're showing a side of you that is just kind of frightening. As much as I've been battling the Varroa War and talking to beekeepers, almost every talk I've given has mentioned Dr. Ramsey because his work was so fundamental in us understanding the reproductive life of Varroa and literally what they feed on. And so he will always be known for that. But it's so exciting that you are you're expanding your work and moved on to another might. I mean, go Dr. Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, Rebecca, we, we do have to credit you in this process. I mean, I think you've heard me say this before, but I probably would not be doing this right now if not for the pep talk that you gave me at one of my first presentations in Pennsylvania. Like, Over a glass of wine and some cheese, yeah. I think, right? Post meeting. Yes. <laughs> you were just leaned up against the refrigerator, given <laughs> incredible advice, and you've uh, changed the course of Varroa research. <laughs> wow, that's super exciting. I don't I don't know that I deserve all that credit, but I love that you actually say it. And I have been such a fan of yours and just so supportive of, of the work because it's one thing to be able to do the science. It's a whole nother thing to be able to communicate that science. And I think that's a lot about what we talked about that night. So Yes. Well thank you. Well thank you. Oh, but now now I'm starting to understand. You, yeah, now I'm starting <laughs> to understand when I asked you Oh, you know Dr. Samuel Ramsey, right? And you just looked at me and blinked. It was like, like <laughs> and I thought, now I understand that that look in those eyes were like, you dummy, you really don't know, do no. you, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. It is very exciting. And, and I also have a word of advice for people. And <laughs> whenever you're, you're at a meeting, it's always talk before them. Don't talk after him. Always give the talk before him. You don't oh, want to do follow. people actually say that? That's, that's what I tell people. You do not oh, want to no. follow Dr. <clears throat> Ramsey. You want to be before him. They're going to compare you to him, <laughs> which, <laughs> which <laughs> is, is a good problem to have, right? But anyway, be before Dr. Ramsey. Anybody out there who's about to give a talk where he's presenting, don't let him go before you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got to tell the people who organize these talks then, because I have no control over that. <laughs> I, so I love the fact that my style of communication has really caught on with people. And that's not a given. Like, I'm, I'm a bit, let's say, odd. And <laughs> I like that that has been resonant, helped people remember the information, and, and really kept people awake and engaged with that content. And I think That's part of the reason why I have the position that I have now at the University of Colorado Boulder. So I teach insect biology. I teach symbiotic relationships, which includes the parasites and the mutualists and all those fascinating connections between organisms. But I also teach science communication. That's probably my most popular course. And Jeff asked what's changed since (laughs) November. Well, I got to teach my SciComm course for the first class, uh, the first time. And I mean, I got letters, like students wrote me letters Handwritten, handwritten about paper how letters? much? Yes. Pa- I, do you know the last time I saw wow. ink on a piece of paper? <laughs> <laughs> a student wrote this who was probably like early 20s. So the, the, the amount of effort that must have gone into remembering how to write. To find a pen. Huge. Yeah, find a pen. <laughs> find a pen. But all of that, and then a front and back letter with someone just can, just trying to convey to me just how big an impact this course has had on them, their capacity to communicate, their comfort with it, and their enjoyment of outreach. And I'm really seeing that this is making the kind of impact that I was hoping for. I want there to be more communicators that are really excited about the things that they're communicating and feel comfortable with communicating it to the general public. I don't want people to approach me with surprise anymore at meetings when they come up to me and they're like, I stayed awake through your whole talk. That was amazing. (laughs) My goal is for that not to be a surprising thing. So, But we as scientists, we're trained to be good researchers. We're trained to be really good at, at 
well, sometimes teaching, but we don't receive really any training in communication. And I think that that is a huge gap that needs to be filled. And so I'm jumping in. That is, that's just excellent because you only have that one chance, that one time to get in front of people. It can make a difference. It's, it's a matter of, are they going to hear your important message or did you lose them because you went down a hole and you didn't invite them to go down there with you? So Precisely. Well said, Becky. Hey, <laughs> I learned from the best. <laughs> <laughs> so let's bring us back. What's new in the land of Varroa? Oof. So the land of Varroa has been an exciting place as of late because we have, we've known for a while that Varroa are really problematic for honeybee health. That's the reason why the mite that's crawling around on our bees is named Varroa destructor. <laughs> that name is, is very purposeful. But the great thing now is we have more knowledge about what exactly Varroa mites are doing when they attach themselves to bees. And it's this set of knowledge that's allowing for people to really dig into this subject in a different way than they did before. So now there are ways that people are digging into the subject on the basis of the nutrition of these mites. There are people digging into the subject and trying to better understand if we could potentially even disrupt their reproductive system. I have a paper that I've just been digging into the data on this for a while and trying to figure out the best way to present all of this, just looking at the reproductive system of the mites and recognizing their capacity to steal elements of the the fat body tissue they're feeding on and incorporate them into their egg yolk. A colleague really pushed me on this. He's like, hey, that's really interesting information that you're presenting there, but it's still, like, we don't really have a why. Like, why would Varroa mites have this entire convoluted system of siphoning egg yolk from their host instead of just making it themselves? Wouldn't it be way easier to just make it themselves? And that was a good point. I thought that I had created enough of a logical chain for it to be clear that mites that have the schedule that Varroa has to keep, where it has to get all of its reproduction done in the few days that it has available to it before its host chews its way out of the cell and leaves, I thought that that was a clear enough logical chain where I didn't need to do any more work on that. But I'm glad that that colleague pushed me in that direction because now we've done all of these exciting metabolic calculations within the mites to show that within their life cycle, they don't actually have the time to make the level of egg yolk that they would need to make to meet the demand to get their offspring to adulthood before the cell is uncapped. And it took some work. Like this, I've never, the metabolic rates of organisms was never really my wheelhouse. I've looked at a lot of papers that incorporate that kind of thing and have been really excited in the past. Like, wow, that's really cool that you can do that. But I wasn't sure what went into it and started working with my lab here at at the university, I have a really great lab. My apiary manager, Chris Borky, is also like unofficially our tech manager because he is an engineer. He's worked on stuff that has been shot into space <laughs> and also nice. is an incredible beekeeper. Um, so when I was talking about how, okay, we're going to need to know the respiration rate of the mites. We're going to need to know how much heat they're producing. And he's like, oh yeah, I can do that. I can build, <laughs> I'm just going to build a little bomb calorimeter for you. It's going to be great. Wow. What? Re- you can do that? Oh, yeah. No, no problem. And while he's working on that, my incredible postdoc, Madison Sankovitz, is doing incredible work on understanding the, like, how the mites, like, they're feeding on the bees and, like, how much heat they're producing and, like, how we can actually track their CO2 in this space because we've got, like, a really tiny space and how many mites we're going to need for it. I'm like, man, I love having such an excited and invested team. My... Two grad students have been kind of watching from the sidelines like, do we jump into this now? Or <laughs> And I'm trying to make sure that they utilize their time efficiently during their first year jumping into their classes. But it seems like every, every time I talk to them, they've got a new idea of, well, what about this? Or could we do it this way? Or how about that? And then my lab manager has just been making space for all of this to occur, like streamlining all of these incredible processes. And it's, it's just... It's been incredible. It, I'm so glad to actually have my own lab now and to be able to come up, like have an idea like this and have people really jump into it with me. So now while I'm 
I, I can't do everything by myself. It's simply not possible. So while I'm actually analyzing the molecular contents of the egg and looking at how much protein is in there and how much carbohydrate and how much lipid is in these eggs and actually working on the calculations for how much time it would take for transcription of this much protein, I've got an entire team that I'm working with that's handling many of these other details. And it's just the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> How is that going to translate into practical use? I am very glad you asked because you have just segued right into the reason why I've been so excited about this work. These mites, they are doing some real like biochemical witchcraft here in order to create this egg yolk that they're creating. And I didn't have all the details when I first started looking at this as a postdoc with the USDA or when I first got the idea to even peer into this system when I was a graduate student. I just knew that something was really weird. I knew these eggs were a bit too large for an organism to be able to produce an egg this size every day. And the more that I really dug into this, I realized They've got to be able to produce really large, really well-formed offspring in order to meet this, this scheduling demand that they have. Because if the bee chews its way out of the cell before its offspring becomes an adult, its fitness is rendered zero. Like, it has no fitness. And that is the strongest evolutionary pressure that you can have on an organism. So under that set of circumstances, you should expect some biochemical witchcraft to be involved. Well, the interesting thing is, if we can in some way disrupt or even just slow down the deposition of stolen protein and stolen lipid into the eggs, then we can slow the process that really doesn't have a lot of buffer room in it, and we can render their fitness zero again. And so that is the next step with all of this. But first, we've just finished up most of the work on these metabolic calculations, we have one more factor to get here before we're done with the whole thing. And then I want that work out there to be totally done with that paper because that one's been a long time coming. It's been like three years or something. And then I can finally start the biggest part of this project. A big chunk of the domestic lab's work is going to be figuring out how well we can even disrupt a process of this nature. But if we can, instead of pumping tons of broad spectrum pesticides into the environment, we can target one process that only this organism is conducting in the hive and have a much more targeted system where it's not about poison, it's about simple disruption of a reproductive process. That is a game changer. It really would be cool, wouldn't it? But it's also really far down the line if it ever would work. So don't get too excited yet, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want a time machine to put you back all the way to 1987 <laughs> so that we, we wouldn't have had gone to go so long fighting these mites without this information. Because that's, as an entomologist, you know, that's the first thing you do is you figure out the life cycle of what's threatening the crop or the livestock. And so, yay to getting it done. Bummer. Oh, yeah. It took so long. Not you. It hasn't taken you long, but it <laughs> yeah. took so long for us to get you into the pipeline. So <laughs> where are you finding time to write grants? That is a great question. Oh, these, these are the professor questions. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I cannot just be a researcher now. When I was a postdoc, I could pretty much focus exclusively on research. I spent my time doing research and doing lots of presentations. But now I have this tripartite system where it's research and then I'm also a teacher and that I'm also mentoring my students and doing service to the university. And within those time slots, I also have to find time to apply for grants. Now, when I get into a writing mode, like the energy just hits me and I get really excited and I just go for it. So that's the best time for me. Like if I'm writing, let's say I'm writing a lecture or I'm writing a paper that energy can just keep going after that. So then I load up a grant right after it. I'm like, okay, it's grant time too. <laughs> but if I am not, like I, I'm, I'm someone whose brain functions on the basis of deep work. And so if my day has a lot of meetings interspersed in it, I can't get any writing done in between. Like my my previous executive assistant would always say, well, we've got one meeting here and then there's a 45 minute break in between. There's another meeting here. And you could probably get a bunch of writing done there. No. no, 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 no. I need deep work time. From here on out, let's put 
all of my meetings, like, I don't know, put like two in the morning and one at the very end of the day. But the rest of the day, I want all the time possible to just be able to focus. And when my brain hyper focuses, I can write a bunch of things at once. I can do a bunch of research, but I can't do the meeting after meeting after meeting and then try to get stuff done in between. Yeah, it becomes very challenging. Hey, let's take this quick break and we'll be right back. Elevate your beekeeping knowledge with Better Bee's free monthly newsletter, The Better Bee Buzz. Get the buzz on seasonal beekeeping tips and education designed to make you a beekeeping superstar. Don't miss out. Sign up today at betterbee.com forward slash sign up and become part of our buzzing community. Happy beekeeping adventures await. Better be your source for beekeeping success. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. Sammy Ramsey, and I think I have a question that every beekeeper wants to know. Teaching apiary, your research apiary, is it full of mites or are there no mites at all? (sighs) (laughs) (laughs) But as you can probably tell by that that deep breath that I just let out, that is a bit of a point of of contention right now. Um, (laughs) I never want to have a research apiary that is in any proximity to anyone else's bees because I'm someone who primarily researches symbiotic relationships in honeybees. And so that means my colonies will have some mites in them and those mites will probably have some viruses. And I don't want my bees becoming the mite bombs for other people's colonies. So I've been trying to find a location within the Boulder city limits where I can put the colony or put some colonies where there are no other beekeepers. And I have not been able to find that. Good luck. I used to keep bees just north of Boulder and there's... (laughs) There's colonies on every hilltop. Yes, always, everywhere. I'm realizing I've got to go farther and farther out. We're even trying to get some some colonies in Rocky Flats. And any of you who are local to the area would be like, really, Rocky Flats, the, the nuclear testing they, site? They blowing bees? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only place I can find where nobody's keeping bees. But I also don't know if I want like two-headed nuclear bees. So, you know, it's trade-offs. It could help trade the problem. Or it could help the mites become radioactive, crazy monster mutants. We never know. I don't recall if there's anything out by DIA out in all their land. A lot of wind. We are looking into absolutely every avenue we can. I've got people on it. I've got a lab manager now. She's looking into it. The Boulder County Beekeepers Association has been really helpful. We're going to find something. But we weren't able to find anything for this year. And so this year, I haven't had any mighty colonies. I have been relying on people, uh, the generosity of people who forgot to treat a colony. Then they email me and let me know they have some mites and I come and pick them up. Did you just say mighty colony? Is that, is that, a, technical, is that a technical term? Because, is that trademark? Yeah, I like can, that. I, can I start using that? We've been saying that so frequently now <laughs> that I keep forgetting that it's not normal parlance until someone new comes into my lab and we say mighty colonies and they start giggling. But yes, um, M-I-T-E-Y, mighty colonies. <laughs> all right. I can see all sorts of cartoons on that right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be a living nightmare. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was really bad. I'll see myself out. <laughs> this will be my last time on the show, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sammy, for your last time on the show. <laughs> no, that was that was that was pretty, was pretty good. Bad. That was a good was one. <laughs> a couple of good ones there. So well, the varroa is such a big topic because it's in everyone's backyard. Anybody who's a beekeeper, they can go out and pop the cover and most likely find one mite in their colony or on the bottom board wherever. The one mite that you've investigated in Thailand that's on our horizon, and you were talking about it last time you heard, the tropolalaps mite. Thankfully, it's not here today. There is concern by some beekeepers that'll get to us eventually, ultimately fairly quickly, maybe through importation through Canada. Sometimes it comes up because of the importation laws in Canada are different than the United States, not to cause problems here across borders. There's enough of that in the world. What is going on with the AAA laps and what can you tell us? Goodness, goodness gracious. Oh, me, oh, me, oh, me, oh, my. And you have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. To solve the problem, too. Um, so I would just like to to 
say as a disclaimer at the very beginning of this, I realize that this information is disturbing and unsettling and will not make people happy to hear as beekeepers. But we really need to we we really need to be getting prepared for this mite as much as possible. And I've been trying to do all that I can. The great part is I'm not doing this stuff alone. There are other labs out there that are really investing in this. The Auburn Lab with Jeff Williams and like his remarkable PhD student who's been working a lot on this, Rogan, and like we've we've got like our work that we're doing here, um, other researchers in, in the US and the UK and other parts of the world are really investing in this. And I think one of the big reasons for that is because the spread has become so clear, like the, the, the acceleration of its spread has become so clear over the last couple of years, especially during the pandemic, that no one can really deny that it's, it's gunning for us. It's, 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 it's trying to find its way here. And we absolutely have to do something about it because we've reached a point now where it could show up at any time. Before, we felt like we would have some sort of buffer or warning. And now we cannot be confident in that because, uh, as you stated earlier, countries on our borders uh, have different importation laws. It's uh, so this is the disturbing part. So I've been working to verify the presence of trophy mites in different regions of the world where it has not been verified that it's present, but there have been reports of it. And people have started picking up on that. And now I'm getting emails from all over the world, <laughs> sometimes in different languages. And people have literally said, like, Google told me you are the guy. <laughs> and so, and it's from veterinarians, it's from beekeepers, it's from conservationists. And they're like, this mite, is this tropolalapse? I'm like, yes, my friend, that is definitely tropolalapse. What country are you in? And it's, the concern now is that it's not, just, it's not, before we would say, okay, well, it's just in Southeast Asia, and then expanded out of Southeast Asia into South Asia and East Asia. And so then we would say, well, it's still just in Asia, but then it moved into Oceania and the Middle East. And we're like, okay, it's not just Asia. But now that it's in Central Asia and right on the border with Europe, that's, that's concerning. And so one region where I've recently received pictures and videos of, of trophy mites is in Southern Russia. And the unfortunate part is that it's right on the border with Ukraine, where I've recently received pictures and, and videos. Pictures and videos can be taken anywhere. These kinds of things can be confusing. And I am not obviously not going to be traveling to Russia anytime soon, but I'm doing my best to actually confirm these detections where I can. I'll be doing some work in Central Asia next in a, a few months, actually, and I'm going to work to verify the presence of those organisms there. But it would really change things if they are actually confirmed on the border with Ukraine, because Ukraine is a country that exports honeybee colonies, and it exports some honeybee colonies to North America. And if they were to end up, you know, from going from Canada to, you know, with mites crossing into the U.S., we could really have a huge quarantine issue on our hands. And that is such a headache. And I just want to make sure that we're prepared. So during my time in Asia, when I collect trophy mites, I have multiple different things that I'm trying to do with them. Some of it's genetic work so we can understand what populations are spreading and where are they coming from. Some of it is work to make sure that our apiary inspectors, who are the, our eyes and ears and our boots on the ground, that they know exactly what a trophy mite looks like and not just from pictures. So we're actually making trophy materials that people can can read and learn about them. But I've also brought back some very, very, very dead samples. Listen to me, everyone. <laughs> they're dead. I'm not bringing anything back alive. Very, very, very dead samples in, in alcohol and allowing the apiary inspectors, uh, sending at least two to, to each of the states so the apiary inspectors have a sample of trophy mites that they can look at, uh, maybe even in a little necklace, someone has suggested, where they can... Like, look at a transparent necklace full of hand sanitizer with a trophy mite stuck wait, in the wait, middle. Wait, do you have an Etsy account? There it goes. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> we should get yeah, on I that, see though. earrings. Earrings, maybe. Oh, earrings might be a little bit more difficult to see if you're the one trying to look at your own earring, but I don't know how dangly your normal earrings are. There you go. Yeah, there's no dairy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a follow-up, a couple of things. One, not every state in the U.S. has an apiary inspector. And two, this is simple, but are you suggesting if I'm teaching a new beekeeper class, do we bring up trophy? I'm very much suggesting that. And thank you so much for asking that question quite directly, because 
I would recommend every new beekeeper class have uh, at least a short lesson on tropy so that people know how to distinguish them from the things in colonies that are typically confused with tropy mites. So there's enough agitation about this online now where people are beginning to send me messages within the U.S. And the top line item, full subject line, all caps, I have tropy in my colonies. We got to shut everything down. And every single time so far, it has been a male varroa mite or a pollen mite or a predatory mite. And the, the, the predatory mites do kind of look like tropy. It's only about sort of the way that they move, but they're not. It's also these male varroa, which people are just not very used to seeing. If you happen to scrape some cappings in your colony, a male varroa can climb out and just bumble around, and it looks really creepy and unsettling. But it looks pretty distinct from a tropy mite if you know what to look for. And so if more beekeepers knew what a tropy mite looked like, under circumstances where it's just arrived, we might be able to find it and eradicate that population of mice before they spread everywhere and we have to change things and quarantine stuff and burn colonies and all that kind of thing. Did you say Australia? Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, Becky, you're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> I was thinking that, but I did not say it. Australia has been through a lot. I mean, they went through so much trying to manage Varroa. And one of the reasons is because they have so many unmanaged colonies of bees that are just wild in the natural environment that could be reservoirs for different parasites like Varroa. And so it wasn't a matter of them simply going to beekeepers and trying to manage their colonies. It was also figuring out what do we do about all the ones that are distributed in tree holes and, and all kinds of other parts of the environment. And it, it's just not an easy thing to do. And even here, where we don't have such a robust population of wild bees, it would be really, really, really difficult for us to control a parasite like tropy. Something that I've also noticed in my time abroad, and I'll, I'll finish this quickly so you guys can jump in with a question. I see questions on your faces. <laughs> but the, the tropy mites leave the colony. I've finally been able to verify. They actually leave the colony during a portion of the year, and we don't know where they're going. Now, almost four months of the year, so I've, I've conducted my research during multiple times of year, but I've never been able to do it during an entire year because I have other responsibilities in the U.S. that I have to get back for. And so I try to do my research at different sections of the year so I can compare all of them. And in especially temperate regions, it seems like between December and late March, the mites are just gone. They're not inside of the colony. You couldn't find them in any part of the colony and not a single mite. They just leave. And where they're going, what they're doing, how they're overwintering, what the deal is there, we don't know yet. And that's the kind of thing that you want to know before an organism like that arrives. This is scary. I know. There I'm sorry. Were, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Thanks a lot, Sammy. <laughs> I thought I read somewhere that there is a potential of a pesticide or a miticide for the AAA lamps that you're working on or that you're involved in? Correct. During my time in Southeast Asia, I've been working on testing what sorts of things can penetrate the cell capping and kill tropy mites. It's not like working on Varroa, because Varroa spend sometimes two weeks on the adult bee population when they leave a cell, but typically on average a week. That's plenty of time for them to be exposed to a number of different kinds of treatments. But tropy mites are more difficult. They spend only a matter of hours outside of the cell. And so any chemical that you apply that's supposed to impact the population outside of the cell, they'll be exposed to it. But for such a brief amount of time that all they can really do with it is use it as a means of gaining resistance to that chemical, but it doesn't typically kill them. It's a sublethal exposure. And so they've become as resistant to chemicals that they've only been exposed to very briefly because they weren't delivered in an effective means of control. When the bees recognize that a larva is old enough where it no longer needs to be fed and is going to transition to a pupa, they do something that should be considered really clever. They cover over that larva with a wax capping, and then the larva itself spins a cocoon around itself and starts transitioning into a pupa and then into an adult. And the purpose of that wax capping, one of the purposes of it, is to protect that bee from parasites and other things that could potentially harm it. However, the parasites have become smart enough to know what a larva smells like when it needs to be capped, and they've jumped into the cells hours before they're about to be capped. And so now the capping that's supposed to protect the bee is now protecting the bee's parasite and sealing it inside of the cell with the bee. Most chemical pesticides these days that can be applied inside of colonies can't penetrate that capping. 
It is wax. It is hydrophobic. And because many of them have water as a carrier, they just can't get through. But we've been testing formic acid as well as heat as a method of deliver, or, uh, a method of treatment. And then we've tested two different ways of applying both of those methods. One that is such a low energy measure for providing heat to the cells that it could even be supplied entirely by solar power. So that one was really cool. There are heating pads that are commercially available now that we've been testing. And then also formic acid, both delivered via liquid formic and formic that's aerosolized in these time-released strips, um, Formic Pro. And so it's been an entire experience. That paper will hopefully be published next month. We just got the finishing touches on it done. Um, we're working on one more figure, and then we're going to send that out. But that information will be available soon. Spoiler alert, but Formic really kicked a lot of butt in these mites. Well, that's good news. Well, that's good news. Wait, that's good news. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Good news. Now, we were able to get up to 100% kill with certain methods of delivery of Formic. Wow, that's excellent. At concentrations that are beekeeper safe? Yes. We are talking about concentrations that are beekeeper safe, but beekeeper safe under 84 degrees Fahrenheit and beekeeper safe under 70% humidity. If you happen to live in Florida, you may never get a time the entire year where you would be able to achieve beekeeper safe levels for utilization of this particular chemical. And that's the other reason why I wanted to have more than one method that we compared there. Heat treatments were actually effective sometimes. The problem was there was a level of inconsistency that was just too high. Like sometimes we would get above 80% kill and then we would move on to the very next colony right next to it and get less than 40%. And we just didn't, there was no way for us to really account for the level of variability with the impact of heat. And it just seems like there's a potential that the heat is not as broadly distributed in the colony as it should be. I hate to ask this next question. Sorry, Jeff, I'm going to jump in. (laughs) That's okay. Sammy. What about viruses and AAA labs? <laughs> so did everyone hear the tone of Becky's voice in asking that question? It's sort of when you hear someone bracing themselves for something that's going to be bad news. <laughs> so we have verified, and by we, I mean the royal we of the scientific community. Um, <laughs> we have verified that there are at least three viruses that trophy mice are capable of vectoring directly to honeybees. So we know deformed wing virus, as well as black queen cell virus. And am I blanking on, I don't know, I'm blanking on the third one. But That'll be in the show um, notes, no problem. Yes, that'll be in the show notes. <laughs> and the problem there being, not only, so the problem there being is that we have not actually tested the other viruses. And so it doesn't mean that Varroa can vector, you know, upwards of 13 viruses and Tropy only has three. It means we just haven't spent a lot of time testing viruses in Varroa to know what others potentially are out there that it's capable of vectoring. I'm also collecting tropy mites. We're preserving them in liquid nitrogen and then bringing them back for viral analysis, looking for viral RNA, looking for, for DNA, and trying to better understand if there are other viruses out there that haven't even been categorized yet, because so far we've only looked for viruses that we know of from Varroa. But what if tropy has its own suite, <laughs> um, creating its own viral complex? So, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Two levels. Oh, no. <laughs> Jeff just had giggles of sadness yeah, over there. I think I'm going to go into crocheting. I think that's going to be my new. We don't have a lot of time left, but Jeff, I think you're going to agree with me. Let's ask him to tell us some good news, something good. Oh, maybe please. about his foundation, maybe about something. We can go back to that letter we talked about in the very beginning. We can talk about changing bikes. Lives. Sammy, we can talk about bikes. Let's- <laughs> He's got a sweet bag <laughs> behind him. Yep. <laughs> Um, If I can just say, the best news that I I think I can possibly deliver to you is that we have the most incredible group of scientists, like young scientists, a diverse cohort of individuals coming up now that are going to have all kinds of new and fresh ideas. We are about to reap the benefits from people actually investing in contexts like diversity and equity and inclusion. There are people who would have you believe that diversity is just diversity for diversity's sake, and it doesn't really matter. And all of these initiatives are just a waste of time and energy and effort. They're trying to get rid of the white people. None of those things are true. (laughs) (laughs) 
What's really, really, really important to understand is that because of this diversity, you have quirky human beings like me and like so many others out here who are showing up in this context with ways of looking at this problem that are odd, different, unique, and allow for ways of answering these questions that maybe people haven't thought of before or invested in previously. And that gets me really happy because I see the way that my students are looking at these problems. I see the way that other people's students are looking at these problems. And I'm really, I'm becoming more and more and more optimistic that some of the biggest issues that we are dealing with are not going to be as crazy as some of the issues that we've dealt with in our past because of this new wave of thinking that's coming our way. I will take that. Yeah. That is excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And I, and I think that's a win. That's definitely a win. I also think that listening to you talk to us today, you've shared so much about that journey. And so you've given beekeepers a little bit of an insight of just everything you're juggling, everything you have to do. And I think the beekeeping community has to understand everything you're doing to contribute and to support our honeybee health. And so... With what you just shared and with what you've shared all along in this hour, it's just, it's been great information. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate you guys providing me this opportunity to really tell people about the great things that are going on and also some of the things we need to be paying more attention to. And maybe we can have you back before another year passes. You can talk to us a little bit more about the foundation because I know you're doing a lot of work with the Ramsey Foundation and you can get us up to date. It's just always a super pleasure to have you on the show enjoy your time this afternoon. Thank you so much. Looking forward to being back. Thank you so much, Sammy. See ya. Every time Sammy's on this show, I come away with a mixture of awe, of being inspired, being a little bit depressed, and always tired. It's a great fun mixture. A mixture of life, actually, is really what it is, but he always brings great information, and I enjoy it. Talking to him and having a conversation, it's just there's so many different levels of what he's doing. And the whole time he's doing it, he's explaining it so well, which is just so impressive. So I I have so much admiration for him. I can't wait to see what he does in the next couple of decades, honestly. We're lucky to have him. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm excited to see what he has next time he's on the show. So it's just amazing. He already has a great body of work for somebody in his position. So it's exciting. There's a lot of things we didn't get a chance to talk to him about. I know we talked to him a little bit about Varroa, but there's more he could talk to us about Varroa. The tropa laylaps, of course, is the scary thing we need to be aware of. There's the foundation he's part of. It's the Pollinator Pandemic Plan that's part of National Geographic and USDA funded about pollinators and the decrease of all. There's a hornet project he's involved in. He was involved in Asian giant hornet stuff that was going on in Washington State. And even more, and it's just, um, boy, he's just everywhere. And I mean that in a great way, and I'm glad he's there and he's working with people who are also that engaged. And you know what I heard, too? I, I loved hearing that he's got a great relationship with the Boulder Beekeepers. I love that they're all trying to solve his mighty problem, <laughs> mighty problem. together. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to have to use that mighty problem. I have a mighty problem in my backyard. Wait, what, Jeff? (laughs) Oh, I think listeners are going to have to listen to this episode twice. I can't wait to listen to it. Definitely, and download the transcripts. I encourage our listeners to go back and listen to our prior episodes with Dr. Samuel Ramsey and to do some of your own research online, YouTube, wherever, and listen to him. He is a wealth of information and is your number one source for Varroa information. You really need to delve into that. He's made a difference, and obviously with what he has up in the pipeline, he's going to continue to support this industry. And that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on the reviews along the top of any web page. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Global Patties, Strong Microbials, and especially Better Bee for their longtime support of this podcast. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. 
Feel free to leave us questions or comments at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.